Okay, it's good to be here tonight, and I thank God for the opportunity to share some things with you from the Word of God, because when we talk about studying the Word of God, you can go as deep as you want to, and you still find yourself just stretch, stretching the surface. It is something about the Word of God, the longer you study, the more you know, and the more you find out that you don't know uh, when you study the Word of God. So we're going to, as, as I was preparing this, I know people pick up st stuff. They say, well, I want to get some a literature that will help me study the Word of God. And a lot of stuff is out there that sounds good. But if you're not aware of some of the historical aspects of writers that is writing on the Bible, you can pick up some bad stuff. Uh, let me have a word. Uh, just pray here. Lord, we want to go into this situation of studying your word and knowing how to begin to dig in your truth that will help us walk the way you would have us to walk. Now be with us and bless us and we'll be very careful to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise of it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, I would like to see a show of hand. How many of you, I know Pastor heard this and Brother Ray, I'm sure have heard this. Uh, how many of you heard of the JEDP theory? It's an, it's an hypothesis. It's, it's an hypothesis. Yeah. So we had about three, four hands raised. Heard about it. Yeah, you heard about it today, didn't you? <laughs> All right. I would like for someone to uh, read a couple of verses. First uh, Peter one twenty one. Marina, you have that? First Peter one twenty one. And Let's see. Uh, Brother Tate, I want you to read 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Now, the reason why I'm having these verses read over in the book of uh, Philippians, the, I think it's the second chapter and the fifth verse says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so when Christ was on the scene, he was a part of the Sermon on the Mount, and he was talking to a lot of Jews. And he said, you have heard that it has been said. Now, those, those words, that statement is a statement was said in that time, but it has a continual aspect. It is still just as good today as it was when it was spoken. And we have to be aware of that. And he said, you have heard that it has been said, but then he makes a declaration because he is speaking in the place of God. But he said, but I say unto you. So he is letting you know, letting us know that there was a lot of things that had been said by the Pharisees and the Sadducees that was called fist laws. And people was believing in these fist laws rather than the word of God. And that thing is still going on today. They are believing stuff 
and coming up with hypothesis. What anybody know can explain to me what an hypothesis is? Huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what? Well, okay. Well, it's a, where you put the theory, but it hasn't been proven. You put it out there. Okay, okay, great. It is something that assumes, because it seems to be explainable of the truth. And it's a theory. And a lot of people are believing hypothesis today when it comes to the word of God. That's the reason why Christ said, you have heard that it has been said. But I say, because they was not truly listening to what he said, that's the reason why they tried to kill him. Not tried, they did kill him. All right. So I'm going to explain a little of this, not in total depth, but in some depth about people picking up stuff because it have seeming or have biblical concepts and they hold on to it. And one of the, one of the damaging aspects of that is that uh, J-E-D-P theory. It's an hypothesis. <clears throat> now let me explain each of these letters in a very brief concept. The J hypothesis is that each uh, J E D period, each of these letters stand for the supposed writers of certain respective portions of scripture. The J stand for Jehovist. It's a Jehovah's document. And it was written about 850 BC. Uh, these people believe in the part, believe, uh, they have this belief of what is called the hexatute. The hexatute actually encompasses the Pentateuch, the first five books. But when they put the Hexateuch in there, they claim Joshua is being part of that Pentateuch. And so it's, that's when it's called Hexateuch, six. That is the Jehovah's, the Elohim basically believe about the same thing. They uh, wrote this document about the scriptures. They wrote it in 750 BC. And then you got a group of so-called wise men came up with what is called the, De the Deuteronomist aspect of scripture. They said uh, it was a better explanation than the Jehovah's and the Elohim document. It was written about 620 BC. And then you have the real religious folk come up. They was called the the priestly document writers. These represent the supposed editorial uh, revisions by these, this group saying that they were a better written document because they was written by Jewish priests. This was written around 500 BC. And so as I looked at these, I, I said, this might be good reading 
for those who have the mental capacity to know the difference between a hypothesis and the truth. The Lord has given men whom he has chosen to give us truth. Do not allow the wisdom of man to innovate or eviscerate great Bible truth that has been canonized, been accepted by the early church, and proven by historical conquest and truth that is written in the word of God. Now, I told you uh, to read First Peter, Second Peter, rather one twenty-one. Read that for us. First Peter. No, it's Second Peter. Second Peter. Yeah, one twenty-one. All right, so the Holy Spirit used these men to write the word of God. Brother Richard, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. use two words innovate and eviscerate innovate means you're reading something that's supposed to be truth but you don't accept it or you try to make it weak you weaken what is already there Eviscerate is to do away with something that is essential. And that is what most of these so-called prophets and disciples are today doing. Because they want you to believe that they are prophets and disciples of God. But to be a prophet of God today you would have to be at least 2100 years of age to be a prophet and to be a disciple you have to have laid your physical eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ after his resurrection so none of these people exist today. So we're talking about studying the word of God. And I, I've got to give you this stuff before I get into the who, what, when, where, and why. Because so many people are caught up in this and they don't know it. And these are the people that is... I'm going to use a term here that Brother Ray uses quite often. There are a lot of folk that are standing in pulpit that is a mile wide. Their teaching is a mile wide, but it's only an inch deep. You can't swim in that. So... Before we venture into any depth of scripture, there are things that we must clear our mind of. Even when we come to know Christ as our savior, people that are truly saved. Remember what Paul said in Romans 12. 
And the second verse, anybody know what that verse says? Romans 12, 2. <laughs> she, she, she's got it. Go ahead and read it. And be not conformed by, to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, and ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's the reason why he says over in Philippians, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. We got a lot of stuff in our mind that we need to get out. Now, don't get me wrong. I am all for education. I'm all for it. I'm all for academia. But don't let a lot of stuff that the world is giving us eviscerate the truth that the Bible gives us. Why is I making that statement? How many, do we have anybody in here that have studied earth science? <laughs> huh? Well, the reason why I ask that is because I'll get to it in just a minute. I got about eight pages on, on Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Well, I thought about this and I was studying it let me just before we <clears throat> get to that this this earth it is the only planet that is actually livable all of the conditions for man animals and plants to survive God created it in six days. There are some theories that say, well, you don't know how long a day was or a night. Or they say, well, earth science, the study of earth science says it starts off say, well, the earth is at least 10,000 years old. When it goes through three conditions that you study in earth science, the Cenozoic period, the Mesozoic period, and the Paleozoic period, it starts off with about 10,000 years up to 600 million years. That's what they say the earth is. But if you take scripture as truth, how many years you think the earth is? If you take earth and you can do it in scripture. Scripture has it. And I went through it and looked at it and came up with it. And I'll give it to you so you can do it too. You can go through it and follow me on it. And I came up with 6,000 999 years. Because what God done when he created the earth, he created the earth 
with what is called the apparent age. When it was created one day, it looked like it was a million years old. Hmm? And you cannot put an age on the earth until you get to Genesis 5. That's when you can start putting an age on the earth. Remember, remember, Adam was created a grown man. He didn't grow into manhood. And he created him on the sixth day. But he does not give an age of Adam when Cain and Abel was born. He does not give an uh, age of him. But when he gets to Genesis 5, when Seth is born, an uh, age is there. 130 years of age. That's how old the earth was when Seth was born. And I went through it. Y'all might want to write these down. Y'all got your pencils? All right. In Genesis 5, 3, he gives the age of Adam. That was 130 years of age. In Genesis 5, 6, he gives the age of Seth. When Enoch was born, that was 105. He was 105. Seth. When Enoch got Canaan, as C A I N A N, Enoch was, that's Genesis 5 12. He was 70 years of old age. Enos is 5 9, uh, Genesis 5 9, he was 90 years of age. In Canaan, Canaan rather, uh, 5 12, 70 years of age when he got Mahalalel. That's 5 15, Genesis 5 15, he was 65 years of age. In 518, Jared gave birth, or his wife rather, gave birth to Enoch. And he was 162 years of age. When Enoch got Methuselah, Enoch was 65 years of age. Now that's where you have to do some calculating. Do it from scripture though. Because you got two people after Methuselah, you have to do some calculating. But you do it from scripture. From Adam to Enoch is 687 years. Now how you get that, because you got these men living long periods of time, you don't count the overlapping years. You got me? 687. You don't count the overlapping years. You always go with the year that somebody was born and add those years together. Now, 
when you come to Methuselah, you know the scripture says he was 600, I mean 969 years of age. That's when he died. Methuselah died in the flood. All the days of Methuselah was 969 years. All right. Now, when, now, you come to two people, Methuselah and Lamech. When Methuselah got Lamech, he was 187 years old. That's Genesis 5, 25. When Lamech got Noah, uh, he was 182 years of age. That's Genesis 5, 28. Noah, when he got his sons and daughters, it's no age there. But you do get the age that he went into the ark. You get the age when he went into the ark. And I think that was... Uh, I know he was 600. I was thinking of uh, the chapter and, and verse. I didn't write that down. But if you take the 187 when Methuselah got Lamech and the 182 when Lamech got Noah, add those together. It's 369. And if you add the 600 years of age when Noah went into our ark, you come up with the exact age of Noah. I mean, uh, with the exact age of Methuselah. And that was the day he went into the ark. So Methuselah died in the flood. It's amazing. All right. Now, I told you I came up with the age of the earth. It's six, nine, nine, nine. Six thousand nine hundred and ninety nine years. How did we come up with that? Well, when we look at those numbers that we have just given to you, uh, that, that, uh, uh, when he was 600 years age and when it's done, that's Genesis 7, 6, and 7. You get the 600 there. All right, so from the time of Adam to Abraham, you got 2,656 years from Adam to Abraham. From Abraham to Christ, you got 2,321 years. And from the advent of Christ till now, you got 2,022 years. And you add that up, you got 6,999 years. 
But if you look at these Cenozoic times, Mesozoic and Paleozoic, you'll come up with either 10,000 to 600 million years of age. It's not so. But I can tell you what's going on now. The rich people are going to leave us down here. They're already trying to get uh, going up in space to and they're talking about colonizing. They're going to colonize, but they're going to die. See, all this stuff is going on is because man is denying God. And people are buying into it. Now, <clears throat> If you want to know about this Cenozoic, Mesozoic, and Paleozoic period, uh, after this period is over, you can uh, ask me and I'll try to give you some information on that. Now, Before we can venture into any depth of scripture, there are some things that we must clear our mind of. Even when we have come to know Christ as our savior. Remember what Paul said in Romans 12 in the second verse we had that, where it says, and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's because the world has given us so much knowledge and, but don't let it destroy your knowledge of God and what he has done. Our mind has been filled with so much of the world of academia and the philosophy of mankind. Now I'm not, remember I said, I, I'm not saying that worldly wisdom isn't good. I'm not saying that. But by the wisdom of this world, the world knew not God. You find that in uh, 1 Corinthians. And as I explain, trying to explain Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Christ knew the phenomenon of this world, but he never allowed it to supersede the will of the Father in his life. And that's what he want us to do. We must develop that mindset when it comes to the word of God. And we have to start with Genesis 1, 1. All that I've said I've leads up to Genesis 1, 1. Because earth science says that the world is up to six million years of age. And so we need to know what the scriptures is teaching, is teaching us. Now, the word of God is settled. It is settled. It's not going to change for anyone. And so we must come to the word of God and realize that the, some people are teaching that there is many years of gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. 
There is no gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. What Genesis 1-1 is, it is an all-inclusive statement. And then when you get to chapter, uh, not chapter, verse 2 is an explanation of what Genesis 1-1 is all about. Let me share with you. This God that we serve stepped out of nothing because it was nowhere for him to step out from. He stepped out of nowhere, stood on nothing, called something out of nothing, sitting on nothing, told it to stay there, and he created an orbit for it. And that orbit that he created for the earth to spin, travel in, is nine million, five, five million, nine hundred, ninety-five miles in that orbit. And this world is running in that orbit, traveling in that orbit, and we think we're standing still, don't we? It is traveling in that orbit 6,000 and no, 6,600,000 miles an hour. And it's spinning as it go around that orbit a thousand miles an hour. And we think we're standing still. But God created something to make us think we're standing still is gravity. And if it wasn't for gravity, we all would slang off into space. But he loves us. And he created all of this for us. <clears throat> Genesis 1-1 is a conclusive statement of all what God has completed. Genesis 1-2 is beginning an explanation of all the intrinsical aspects of his creation. Now, I know all of us have heard of the Big Bang Theory. That the Earth came into existence because some nebulous gases and dust gathered together because a meteorite exploded and the Earth formed. But that's not what the scripture says. The earth was here when he put the solar system in existence. When he created the stars and all of that. <laughs> that was the fourth day. I didn't give you the third day. The third day, he created plant life, grass, trees, fruit trees, and so forth. The fourth day is when he created the stars and planets and so forth. The fifth day, he, he created all the sea creatures as 120 and 23. Now, his glorious and most fascinating creation was on the sixth day. And he created man for his own glory. All this he done, he had no one to share it with, and so he created man. Somebody that he could communicate with.
On that sixth day, he created all living creatures on the earth. Cattle, creeping things, beasts, and mankind, and gave man dominion over all that he had created. And then when you get to chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3, he said he rest. Because everything was done in those six days, and he rest on the seventh day. Now, I just thought of this. I didn't put it in my notes. But you got these people, they say, well, uh, God created the seventh day for worship. That's Saturday. But in Leviticus, I think it's Leviticus 23, where he said he's going to start a holy convocation the day after the Sabbath. And you can count it off. And he's talking about Sunday. Sunday is the day after the Sabbath. That's when Christ rose from the grave. And if you do a real study on the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit came to initiate the church, it was on a Sunday. All this stuff is in scripture, but if you don't know how to get it out of there, it's just there. It's just there. And this is the reason why we need to be in a place where the scriptures are being taught. I thank God for our pastor. Many times he preached I sit there and I get so convicted, and if I could get saved again, I'd get saved all over again. <laughs> but I know I can't get saved again. I'm going to say this, and I'm going to close. Uh, you know, when you first get saved, you, you're a little arrogant. <laughs> Nobody knows nothing but you. Y'all yeah, remember those days? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody knows that. And this was right after I finished Temple. And we were starting an independent mission before we went into the church. Uh, nobody in here knows about those days but the Tates and my wife. And my wife and I, we was there cleaning up one day, getting ready to open this, this storefront missions. And this preacher came by and he stopped and he said, what are you all doing? And I told him, well, we're fixing to open a mission here and uh, start a mission work. He said, oh, you, uh, are you a Christian? I said, yes, I am. And he said, you're doing this work then. You must be baptized and full of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues. I said, wait a minute. I say, I'm saved. I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I haven't spoken in tongues. He said, well, you must be if you're doing this. I said, no. I say, there is no way in Scripture that a believer has to speak in tongues in this day and time. And he said, well, Jesus spoke in tongues. I said, no, it's not in Scripture that he spoke in tongues. He said, yes, he did. You just hadn't read your Bible. I said, yes, I have. He said, Jesus spoke in tongues when he said, Lassa, Lassa, Sabathani. I said, mister, that's not speaking in tongues. I said, that is the Aramaic language, which was present while Jesus was on the face of the earth. I said, your problem is you don't believe the Bible. Now, this was a pastor of a church. I said, your problem is you do not believe the Bible. He said, oh, yes, I do. I've been a pastor for so many years. So I pulled out my little testament. He said, 
as I was pulling out my testament, he said, you know, you can lose your salvation. I said, no, I can't. And so I pulled out that little testament and opened it to John 3.16. And I asked him, I said, what about reading John 3.16 for me? So he read it. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I paused a minute. And I said, you didn't read that right. He said, yes, I did. I read exactly what was there. So I, I said, well, let me read it. So I, I took it to Testament. And I could have quoted it, but I was reading it so he knew that I read that. What was that? And I see, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have temporary life. That's not that. He said, you, you said temporary life. I said, didn't you tell me that I could lose my salvation? If I could lose it, that's temporary. And he said, yeah, you, you one of them educated ones, aren't you? I said, no, I'm just a believer. I said, I just believe the word of God and you do not believe the word of God. That's the reason why you need to be in a place that is teaching the word of God. That people can help you to understand what the word of God is saying. Amen. 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 Is there any questions I might be able to answer them if I can't? The pastor's back there. Yeah, it's from the head to the heart. <laughs> That's what the gap is. Okay, that uh, word innovate, that you were talking about, uh, elaborate on that just a little bit. Innovate. Uh, innovate. Innovate. Yeah. Innovate. 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 Uh, make it more uh, actually to waste it and eviscerate is to do away with something that is essential all right any other questions It, it's, it says he's going to have a holy convocation the day after the Sabbath. Yeah. Remember this. Let me, I want you to turn with me to Leviticus, not Leviticus, Luke 1, 68. One sixty-eight, Brother Bun, you have that. Yes, Read that verse for us. One sixty-eight. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He hath visited and redeemed His people. Okay, visited and redeemed His people. When the Bible was anglicized. In other words, when it was taken from the Greek writings and it was anglicized and it said visit, you don't visit something you own, but that was the best word that they could come up with. The original word, y'all know what it is? The original word that was there in the Greek was episkeptomaya. <laughs> huh? You want me to, you ain't gonna, un, unless you have a Hebrew Greek Bible, 
You won't find it in the regular dictionary. I'll spell it for you. It's E P I S K E P T O M A I Episkeptomia. Now it has a whole vast of meaning, and I wrote some of the meanings down because he wants you to know him. He wants you to know what he done for you. It signifies that when he visited the earth, he is not only our redeemer, he is our exculpatory evidence. Exculpatory means that he totally sets you free. That's what a lawyer, a judge sometime asks the, one of the lawyers that is there for the defense. He said, what kind of exculpatory evidence do you have? In other words, to set this person free. So Christ came to look into something, to examine closely, to inspect and observe, to look upon with mercy, favor, or regard, to take care of a nursing the sick. That's what it means. And he took care of our sick, sin, sin, sick situation. He took care of it. He is our exculpatory evidence. He set us free. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. It's amazing. If you just study the word of God and allow, and allow the word of God to help you. Y'all didn't know he was going to Seminary 101 tonight, did you? <laughs> Brother Gerald. Read it. And he said the eighth day, didn't he? That's the day after the Sabbath. And he was going to do something new. And, he, and Jesus was that meat offering. Amen. 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 Brother Bonner. Yes, ma'am. Eli, La Sabathani. That's what Christ said on the cross. Yeah. And, and what he said, he was quoting Psalms 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the reason why he fors forsook him, because he knew at that time his father had turned his back on him because Jesus took our sin and put it on himself. And God could not look on sin. See, that's what you're talking about. That's what, that's what you preached about. So, that's what you preached about. So, going out asking you about it. You know, when he See, uh, Corinthians 5 says, I forget exactly, it's in the fifth chapter. It says, but he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 
And then when you get to 1 Corinthians 15, 57, and 58, it says, But thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Brother Bonner.